There was a, a pastor who had come kind of to burn out and stress a little bit, and uh, he woke up one Sunday, and it was one of those beautiful mornings, kind of like today, and uh, he decided he wanted to go play golf and not go preach. So he called up his associate pastor, and he convinced him that he was sick and that he was going to go, uh, he's going to stay home today, and if his associate could, could preach, and so they worked that out. So he decided to go 50 miles away to play golf because he knew that there would be no one that uh, would know him there. And as he goes out on this beautiful day to, to the first hole, there was an angel that spoke to the Lord and said, are you really going to let him get away with this? Are you going to let him get away with this? And the pastor, uh, the Lord said, just, just wait. And so the pastor, nobody else is on the course. Everybody, I guess, is at church, but he's able to play this whole course by himself. T. It's a, it's a par four, 420 yards. He tees it up. He hits the most beautiful drive he has ever hit. And it uh, hits in the fringe, and then it keeps on going. It rolls into the cup. It was just amazing. And the angel turns to the Lord again and says, I cannot believe you're going to let him get away with this. And the Lord said with a smile, he said, who's he going to tell? <laughs> you know, when it comes to stress... We will make decisions and uh, deal with things, and we're going to talk about this a little bit today. I believe God has a very pertinent word for us today. He does for me. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to 1 Kings chapter 19, and it's on your devices or on the screen, but I want you to stand with me as we read God's word today. 1 Kings chapter 19, and we're going to be reading 18 verses, so hang on, and let's see what the scriptures say say. It says this, Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid and he arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. And he lay down and slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mount of God. There he came to a cave and lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I've been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke it in pieces, the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper or a still small voice. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant thrown down your altars and killed your prophets with a sword. And I, even I only am left and they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said to him, go return, go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, you shall anoint Haziel to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shephat of Abel Meholah, you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. And the one who escapes from the sword of Haziel shall Jehu put to death. 
And the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Let's pray together. Lord, this morning we come, we need you desperately. Lord, nobody came today just to socialize. We, we have enough socialization, Father. We need to hear from the living God. And I pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, you will speak to our hearts right now. You will open the eyes of our heart and the ears of our heart, Lord, to see and hear you fresh. Lord, we're dealing on a very pertinent topic. You know what it is. You've you've, uh, you've been working on me all week long. Father, I just pray that you would give clarity and that, Lord, we will not walk out of this facility the same way we walked in, but, Lord, we will walk out to you. So, Lord, speak to us now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. When I originally started this series on on the mountaintops, I had it all set out, and then the Lord just kind of interrupts a little bit. I didn't have Mount Horeb on here initially, and uh, but the Lord just started impressing something upon my heart that I think is very pertinent to us today, and today is the day. So it's not accidental you be here. It's not accidental for this word to come forth. But let me give you a little uh, thought up front. You know, the United States, we love our freedom. We love everything about the United States. But it's been discovered that one in four Americans struggle from an anxiety disorder or overload of stress. And a, that's 40 million people. Gallup poll did a study of 14 different countries, and they studied the world mental health that was going on in those countries. And they discovered that Americans had the highest level of anxiety disorders in those 14 countries. Some of these countries were Nigeria, Lebanon, and the Ukraine. And the ranking of the most dangerous countries for foreigners... Nigeria was 5th, Ukraine was 10th, and Lebanon was 12th. And yet, America outdistanced them all when it came to stress and anxiety. In our country, 28, every 28 seconds, somebody commits suicide. One in four Americans. I would say in this room that... Uh, Some of you would say it's not a matter of if you have overdue stress, it's when you have it, and you walk in it all the time. I love stories like today because I can identify more with this Elijah than the one that brought him to this point. So let me give you a little background to pick up where we were today. We didn't talk about Mount Carmel because Disciple Now, uh, it was spoke on, and there's been other opportunities I've had to speak on Mount Carmel. And Mount Carmel was where Elijah challenged the prophets of Baal and Asherah, 450 prophets of Baal, 400 prophets of Asherah, to a contest. They were in the middle of a drought, and on Mount Carmel, they all came up, and this was the contest. The prophets of Baal would would take their sacrifice, oxen, cut it up, and uh, offer it to the Lord. Elijah would do the same thing. And the, and the one who, uh, who responded by fire, that would be the true God. So what happens? The prophets, they dance around all day. They cut themselves. They do all these things. Nothing happens. Elijah taunts them. And then it came Elijah's turn. He rebuilt the altar. He uh, put the sacrifice on the altar. He soaked it in water. They're in the middle of a drought, but he soaks it in water. He calls out to the Lord. And here comes fire from heaven, consumes the, uh, not just the sacrifice, but the whole altar, the water and everything. And then it's proven who God is. All these prophets, these false teachers are put to death because of this. Then Elijah goes over and he begins to pray for the rain. They'd been in the middle of a drought, begins to pray, and a cloud forms, and lo and behold, it's going to start raining. And then what he does is a strange thing. Ahab the king has gone back to Jezreel where his wife Jezebel is. And actually, Elijah runs those 17 miles to catch and pass the chariot to get to Jezreel when the report is given. And that's when we pick it up today. Ahab has just gone into his wife Jezebel. 
and has given the report of how, how the God, true God of heaven, sent the, the fire down, consumed the altar, and it was incredible. And Jezebel all of a sudden turns and sends a message to Elijah saying this, I'm going to kill you. Because of this, you're going to be just like one of those prophets. You're going to be dead. Now, Elijah, the man of God, what does he do? He hightails it and runs. He runs all the way to Beersheba, which is going to be over 100 miles going south. And he's going to eventually be on Mount Horeb, which is on down even farther south. And he took off and runs. So my thought is, here's the man of God that has just confronted all these prophets, has cut up the sacrifice. God has answered from heaven with fire, and he prays for rain. It rains, and then he goes to the, the place in Jezreel, and he hears one woman say, I'm going to kill you, and he runs. He runs. And I thought about this. You, 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 you heard it, what he said. He was under such stress, under such duress, he wanted God to take his life. And I'm thinking, how can this be the same man? And I tell you what, though, I love the humanness that God has put in the scriptures. Because it helps me. I can identify. I can't identify on, on the Mount Carmel where the fire comes down, but I can identify with a guy sitting under a tree saying, God, take my life. And most of you can too. In America, we struggle with anxiety, and we struggle with stress. And that's exactly where Elijah finds himself. And so as I begin to pray about this, God, you show us how we can deal with this incredible extreme problem that exists, not just in America, but in Central, and how we can deal with this according to your word. I look at what caused Elijah's anxiety, and I think you can, it's pretty obvious once you look at it. Number one, he was completely physically empty. His physical tank was empty. He had been up, he had been dealing with these prophets on Mount Carmel. He had been in a long day. He had dealt with that. There was the intensity of, of praying. There was the intensity of praying for rain. All that took place. He ran for 17 miles. You know, there is something called adrenaline. And we, many, many people are adrenaline junkies. But adrenaline is something we, we go on. It, it's something that gives us the, the energy to go on sometimes when you can't. People under adrenaline influence have been able to do superhuman things, it seems like. Elijah had an incredible adrenaline rush. And in the middle, this is what happens, though, is that you have certain chemicals that keep your body balanced. Two of those are in the area of serotonin, and oxytocin. These things keep your physical at peace. But what happens is, is that when you have an adrenaline rush, those tanks get sucked dry because that adrenaline has been so intense in your system. That's why when you do a, something that takes a lot of adrenaline out of you, you feel exhausted afterwards. And that's what happened to Elijah. He had, he had had such an adrenaline rush and the physical exertion that he is totally fatigued, and he is under an incredible fatigue factor. So he is physically exhausted. Number two is he was spiritually depleted. You would think, man, you talk about the ultimate mountaintop experience, but he was totally wasted spiritually. He had given out everything that God had given him to give out. He had gone, and he had, in the midst of his prayer, in the midst of this spiritual battle and conflict, his intense prayer of rain, he had given out all he had spiritually, and he, he became dry. There, it is very understandable how that can happen. And, and, and this is the other thing. He had such high expectations that the whole nation would repent because of this. And when Ahab goes to tell Jezebel, he knows it's not reality. So spiritually, he felt like a failure. I understand spiritual depletion and physical depletion. Um, you know, just I'm going to give you an inkling into the um, psyche and to the life of your pastor right quick. Um, I, I preached in the first service, which is a heck of an adrenaline rush. 
I preach again, which is another adrenaline rush. I've been up early this morning. My nights before I preach are very restless because, believe it or not, this is what I hang on to. I believe that what we enter into, every worship encounter, when we break forth the Word of God, it is like a boxing match. It is a wrestling for the souls of men. I believe that God wants to pour himself out. You see, and Alan and Brett feel the same way. When we step up here to proclaim word, God's word, we do it as though we will never have another opportunity. That somebody's life hangs in the balance. We also believe that every time we get up to speak, that it may be the day that the Holy Spirit just decides to visit us in an incredible way. We, we, we hang on to that. That's the intensity of getting up and proclaiming God's word. And, and this is what will happen. Uh, I've been up early, wrestled all night, uh, um, preached, take a quick break, come in here and do it again. I will hug on your necks at the door and, and uh, pray with some of you. And uh, some people are going to come and say, hey, why don't you give me counsel? I'm a terrible counselor at that point. I've given out everything that I have to give out. I am like a, a, a wash rag that's just depleted. And, and, and that's the way it is. And uh, what, what's interesting is, is uh, I'll go stand at the door and sometimes. I'm, I'm, I'm tapped out. I'm just telling you, I'm tapped out. I've given everything that God has given me to proclaim. Now, you're saying, well, Mark, doesn't the Holy Spirit give you fresh? Yeah. Yeah, he does. I want to be his voice. I want to do those things. But it's interesting. I'll go stand at the door, hug on your necks, because I love you. Pam and I love you, and we just want to encourage you during the course of the week. And uh, it's funny some of the things you get at the door. I won't go over all of them because some of you are in this room. But, <laughs> but we had a person who used to attend Central that they would come. I mean, you know, you just think, man, we're in spiritual conflict. You know, this is what it's all about. And, and they would come by and they say, they would say something about my delivery. And I'm thinking, thank you. I, 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 I mean, I'm thinking, we have just gone through this spiritual conflict and you're saying something about my delivery. And, uh, and I'm thinking, that, that's really strange. But you're dry and, and stuff like that occurs, and, and that's just the way it is. I, I, I appreciate my wife so much because she knows, she knows. See, uh, tonight we'll meet with our home group. That'll be a replenishing time. But tomorrow I'm toast, man. I, I've given out everything I have to give out, and that's the way it's supposed to be. And so Mondays are not, are not great days for me as far as, I've got to take time to replenish. But what happens is, is that when you've given everything out that you've got, and somebody can come up and criticize you, and at one point it may not bother you, but when you're physically and spiritually depleted, man, it hits, its, it hits a wound. And that's where Elijah was. He was physically exhausted, he was spiritually depleted, and then the other thing was, he was emotionally spent. He was emotionally, he had given out everything in his emotional tanks. He was, because he was isolated now, he felt like a failure. He felt like he had, I, I think he felt like he had let God down because the, the, the nation did not repent. And so he's physically exhausted, he's spiritually depleted, and now he's emotionally given out everything that he has. He is a train wreck waiting to happen. His serotonin level, oxytocin, I, I can just imagine they were, from all of that, they, he, was, he was toast, man. And that's the way he was. And so that's why when one woman says, I'm going to kill you, even though he had done this incredible miracle and he trusted God, that's why he went and ran. And it's interesting to see what happened uh, in the midst of his discouragement. The scripture says, number one, that fear took over. Fear took over. Second of all, he, he had a flight mentality. He could not cope. We, we talked today about how a generation is not learning how to cope very well. But this was what Elijah was hit with. He took off and ran. He wanted to get away from this stress the best way that he could. He had no energy. He just laid down under that broom tree. And uh, he was isolated. He felt like a failure. And then suicidal thoughts came into his mind. He said, God, just take me. Just take me. Now listen, this, does this even sound like the same guy that was on Mount Carmel doing that? But this is where he is today. 
Listen, some of you, many of you, most of you in this room are overloaded with stress and anxiety. Is it our fault? Maybe. But God gives us a human picture of one of his prophets dealing with this same thing. And I think we can learn today, if we're going to honor the Lord with our lives, how we can deal with this problem that is plaguing our culture. What, what creates your greatest anxiety? Don't, don't answer out loud. But I'm going to give you just some thoughts about what can create your greatest anxiety. Maybe it's failure. A past failure, a present failure, something that you uh, became very disappointed in. Because of that, you've been discouraged, you've been stressed, you've been anxious, maybe depressed. It was a, it was a past failure you, or, or a present failure. You know, you're not where you thought you'd be career-wise. You're not where you thought you'd be uh, family-wise. You're just not there. And thus, there's this failure that you feel like in your life. And you look back and you say, where did the wheels fall off at? I'm just not where I thought I would be. And you're just discouraged. You're depressed. You're full of anxiety because of that. How about relationship failure? You've gone through a divorce or your kids have rebelled and maybe not turned out the way you raised them. Or you had a close friend who has betrayed you. And and, in the the quiet moments, it just creates depression and anxiety and stress all in you. And it's there. How about, this is huge, comparison. You don't measure up. Facebook has done tremendous strides in making us feel lousy about ourselves. You compare somebody's made-up day out of their pictures and their, their posts compared to your everyday life. And let me tell you, it's not true. And so what we do is we start comparing ourselves to that. I compare myself to other pastors at times. I compare myself to those that are, you know, running tens of thousands, you know, and you're thinking, man, God, why are they, you know... And we do that. And Facebook and social media lets us do that all the time. And so what happens is, is we compare ourselves to one another. Or we compare, we find that old high school classmate in Facebook. And we're thinking, man, they look old. Does that mean I'm old? I mean, we start comparing all of a sudden. And we start feeling lousy. And we get discouraged. And we get stressed. Many people are depressed because of that comparison. I don't measure up mentality. Health issues. Many people are bothered uh, by health issues, and I understand that, but it creates angst, it creates anxiety, it creates uh, depression in some, discouragement in them. How about unmet expectations? You had expectations of certain things being certain ways, and they didn't turn out that way. And so when these expectations were not met, you get frustrated, you get discouraged, you get depressed. You're you're full of anxiety because of that. How about intimidation? Some people get full of discouragement and depressed because of intimidation. They had a boss that they could never please. They had a parent, a dad they could never please. He's dead and gone, but they're still living under the incredible depression and distress of not being able to do anything about that. How about spiritual letdown? God, where were you? God, you could have changed this. They shouldn't have died. God, where were you? God, where were you when my kids were going through this? God, where were you in this health issue? God, where were you when we couldn't make ends meet? God, where were you? And we keep saying, God, 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 in these things. And we get, uh, we get spiritual letdown, and there's the frustration that comes with that. And I know these are big compared to how are we going to get the kids to hear, the kids to hear just the time demands that are on you. And then sometimes there's discouragement and distress that comes from an unknown source. Sometimes it's spiritual that comes upon you. Sometimes it's just life demands and they just add to that. Sometimes you just don't know where it comes from. You know, sometimes it's just physical. You've given out uh, as much as you can, your, your oxytocin, your serotonin level is, is depleted. There is also uh, things that come against you that make you want to run and uh, uh, flee. 
And uh, so these struggles are on you, and you, you're thinking, man, God, I have no peace in me. I just want to sit down under the broom tree and just do nothing. Well, it's interesting that uh, in how we respond to uh, stress, sometimes people isolate. I'm an isolator. If I get sick physically, just leave me alone. Pam and I are different in that. We've had to learn through that. Because I, if I'm ill, just leave me alone. If I'm going through something that's a struggle, just leave me alone. Pam and I have an agreement that uh, uh, if I die first, she's our, if she dies first, she's already told the kids, don't let your dad run away. I mean, this is just part of the way I'm wired. I love my wife to death. She knows when I hit those dry points that I was talking about earlier, she knows when to uh, pull me out of isolation to be with people. And you're thinking, Mark, that's a lot of responsibility for her. We need other people. I, I help her in certain areas. We, we need that. But isolation, some people respond by isolating. Some people lash out. They lash out at others. They do what they can to hurt other people. Hurt people hurt people. And people that are depressed and discouraged want to bring everybody else into the pity party with them. Or if it's true depression, true discouragement that they can't figure out what's going on, then sometimes you just can't help but get caught in that melancholy situation that they're going in. But they sometimes lash out at others. Or they lash out against themselves. You know, the thing that happens with many teenagers and many young adults, it, which just is, is overwhelming, is the cutting issue that happens. The, the hurting of their own body because they're going through discouragement or, or distress or depression. So they hurt themselves, which eventually could turn into suicidal uh, thoughts and situations. Let me say this about cutting or suicide right now. If you're thinking about it or you've attempted or you are, are even, it's an inkling to you, you, you cry out to somebody. You grab anybody and say, I'm struggling in this area. Because you need help in, in dealing with this. You can't deal with it on your own. Another thing is, is some people just mope around. They're just moping. I mean, you, you can tell. They're carrying the weight of the world on them all of a sudden. Here, here's another way that people respond. It's what I call temporary highs. Remember I told you that the God, the God made us up in, in certain ways with these certain Chemicals in our bodies, oxytocin, serotonin, that keep us level and, and at peace. Uh, and, and I'm not taking away from the Holy Spirit. I'm just saying this is the way God created us. And you've got cortisol, which is this um, uh, chemical that's released by your body. When, when it's, it's similar. The best thing I can compare it to is like uh, you've got a deer and you've got a predator that's coming after that deer. That that predator coming after the deer, the deer has this flight mentality, this incredible rush of stuff. That's what cortisol does, and it takes your peace away, okay? So in other words, if you have a boss that you can never please, and you go into your work environment every day, and it's that, it's that flight mentality, that's where that's coming from. That's why you can't have any peace, because you're, you're fearful of your job, or you're fearful of things, and these happen. So what we do is, as humans, we try to do things to expedite getting us feeling better about ourselves, right? There's a couple that me mentioned to you. One is what we call endorphins. Endorphins, have you ever heard of what's called a runner's high? You got somebody that loves to run and they love to work out and they love to do it all the time because what it does is it releases endorphins in your body and what that does is it gives you a temporary high. Temporary high. And it eventually it will go away. And so you struggle when that happens again. So, so that's why somebody, when they keep running, they keep running. Keep working out. They keep working out. Because it gives them that uh, temporary high from that. Endorphins. Number two is, is something your body releases called dopamine. Dopamine is, uh, and you've probably heard about dopamine. You, you know, somebody, if, a, if a, a man or a woman struggles with, or a teenager struggles with pornography, they talk about something that gets released in your body called dopamine. And this dopamine gives you a fantasy reality. 
And with that fantasy reality, you escape the pain that you're going in. Many people do this with drugs and alcohol. It, it creates a fantasy realm that you escape. You want to escape this discouragement. You want to escape this distress that you're under. Uh, here's another one. Gambling. You, you know, you get into... The, 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 the hard part about dopamine is that it's addictive. Highly addictive. And the way to get that high is just going to going to strangle you even more. You know, we sing about being free indeed. Some of you in this room haven't, haven't been able to feel freedom in forever because of addiction stuff that has got you bound up that you're struggling with. I, I mean, I know I'm right in, in that. And so we have that, that struggle that comes um, with that. Uh, here, let me, let me give you a dopamine one. You're going to say, oh, okay, Mark, I've, I don't struggle with porn. I don't struggle with alcohol and drugs. I don't struggle with gambling shopping. Some people cannot go into a store without coming out with something because it gives them a rush to cover up that hurt that is there. But here's one. We're all addicted to our phones today. We're all addicted to our phones. I mean, uh, I, I've tried to put disciplines in my life. If I go out and eat with you, I don't take my phone in. Pam and I go out, you know, it's not, not there. Um, you know, I, I don't bring it up here to preach with me to answer calls. I've learned to do some of those things. Uh, but when we come home, we uh, have it either with us or across the room. And every time, whatever your chime or your ding is for an email or an Instagram or text or, or whatever it may be, you can't help but go do it because it gives you a shot. And you feel like I got to go grab it or I'm not going to exist anymore. See, that's that shot of dopamine. And we want it to take away the discouragement and pain that's there. You know I'm right. I'm not making this stuff up. And so what we do is we try to do temporary things to fix something that can't be fixed that way. Oh, it can give you a, a small comfort, but it can destroy you in the meantime. Let me say this. I would rather you get a runner's high than dopamine. Okay? Uh, so... Hear me on that. And I'm, I'm not anti-exercise, obviously, but, but uh, uh, you know, you can't see those as the permanent fix for what you're struggling with here. But God and Elijah, right quick, look, look how God dealt with Elijah. I love this in the scriptures. Number one, he said he had an, he had an angel go and wake him up under the broom tree, and he said, what, eat. Eat and sleep. Eat and rest. He needed to get his physical tanks filled back up. Some of you, the best thing, and this is all you're going to hear out of this message, some of you need permission to take a nap. Not, during, not right now. <laughs> you need to go take a nap. You need to rest. You're, you're burning the candle at both ends, and you're wondering why your spiritual life is so dry. You're chasing your kids to a thousand different things, and you're wondering why you're so dry spiritually. You need to take a nap. You need to rest. Mark, I can't do that. I've come to the conclusion we can do what we want to do. And so I just encourage you today in that area because the Lord said to Elijah, I mean, you know, eat. Now sleep. Eat and sleep. But number, se uh, n number next in verse 7, he talks about that this journey is too great for you. What the Lord is getting across to Elijah is you can't do this on your own. Listen, folks, you were not meant to walk this alone. Depression, stress, discouragement. You were not meant to walk it alone. You need to talk to somebody else. The third thing that uh, the Lord told Elijah is, come up the mountain with me. Here we are on the mountaintop. Come up to the mountain with me. Come up Mount Horeb and meet with me. Leave where you're at and you need to come to me. Come to where the mountain is. In other words, I see it this way. You need to get another vantage point of your life right now. You see, we're so much in the trees, we can't see what's going on. And the, and the Lord is telling Elijah, come up to Mount Horeb with me. We're going to have a, a time together up here. Some of you today need to move from where you're at, and you need to draw closer to the Lord. You need to get a better vantage point of your life right now. It's like the pilot who, who was flying a small aircraft, and as he's flying along, he starts hearing some gnawing on the cables in the plane. He soon realizes that he's in trouble 
because a rodent has somehow got into the engine and is gnawing at the cables of his airplane and knows it's a matter of time that if they gnaw through the right cables that he is destroyed. He radios and says, what am I supposed to do? And they said this, they said, you need to go higher. As you go higher, the rodent can't handle it and he will die because of the altitude of where you are. And so he went up and sure enough that happened. Some of you are living with the rats so much down here that you need to go to a higher altitude with the Lord and see how He can take away some of those things in your life. Jesus said, Come unto me, all you that are weary, heavy laden, and I will give you rest for your souls. He didn't say go out and do this. He didn't say go out and do that. He said, Come to me. The next thing He told him was, as you come up on the mountain... Know that I'm with you. In other words, the Lord wasn't in the, uh, he wasn't in the fire. He wasn't in the wind. wasn't in the earthquake. It was in the still small voice. Know that I am with you. And I love, I love this about being with him. He gave him a fresh assignment. You know, when you failed, and you feel like you failed God, and you failed everybody else, the loving Heavenly Father just slowly says, come to me. And he says, let me give you something else to do. You didn't fail me. Some of you today need to know that kind of heavenly father. You've seen God as the one who's beating on you, or you've seen God just, you disappoint him all the time. Let me tell you, he's saying, come to me and get a new assignment. Let me, let me just try to bring this to a practical point for you. Because this was the instruction that eventually Elijah was given. Number one was this. I've got a new assignment for you. For you. Give yourself away. Give yourself away. It's been, uh, it's been proven even that in the physical body that what... I mentioned serotonin and oxytocin. Those things, those things that make you peaceful in your life. Oxytocin is the thing that gives your life purpose. You feel purpose and meaning. Jesus was right on when he said, to be great in God's kingdom, learn to be the servant of all. It's been shown that as a more a person is able to help others and give themselves away, the more they feel worth in themselves. It's not people bowing down to you. It's you being way, willing to wash the feet of others. Give yourself away. The, the second thought right behind that is you need to get with others. The Lord told Elijah, he said, I want you to go and anoint him, king of Syria. I want you to go and anoint him. And I want you to go and anoint, anoint Elisha, who's going to take your place. And oh, by the way, Elisha, I know you're feeling all alone, but I want you to know I've got 7,000 that have never even hinted at worshiping Baal. They love me. And all of a sudden, Elijah knew he wasn't alone. I want, I want to give you three, three practical things. This is real quick, and then I'm, I'm done. First of all is this. If you today are battling anxiety and discouragement or depression, tell someone. You know, tell somebody. Just tell somebody, I'm struggling today. And maybe they can just pray for you. But maybe it's part of that release of confession. Tell somebody, especially if you have suicidal or cutting thoughts, you make sure you tell someone. Second of all, look for God in the small things. Look for God in the still small voice. We want to see God on the mountaintops, but I'm telling you, God comes in the stillness. I, uh, I love our students and I, I love our, our children when they go to camps, especially, or D, D now, whatever it may be. But I tell you what, I'm most concerned at that point for, for, their, for them. And I tell you why. It's amazing how that on a spiritual mountaintop, the battle in the valley does not go away. And they come back down, and it's intense. And I'm always concerned. But, but many of us are living life like shook up snow scenes. You know what I'm talking about? And we can't hear God at all. We, we try to cut on Christian radio or something, and that, but no, no, it's, we're too shook up. We're not willing to get still. And I think you need to get still to hear that still, small voice. And then thirdly is this. If, if, if you're battling, tell somebody. Look for God in the small things. And then thirdly is this. Start moving. 
Start moving. Move to God's advantage. Move to God's vantage point. In other words, you can't sit under your broom tree. You can't pull your car to the side of the road in the fog and just think it's going to go away. Many people just do that. They just think, I, I'm just going to give up. I'm going to quit. No, 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 no. No, no, no. You know, the Lord never um, said anything evil about Elijah, what he was going through. I mean, it was just part of the journey. And that's part of our journey, too. We're going to go through discouraged times. We're going to go through down times. That's why he's given us the Holy Spirit. That's why he's given him his, his self. But the Lord is also encouraging Elijah to come to him. Come to a new vantage point. Some of you need to be stoked in the bottom to come to the Lord. Tell somebody. Tell somebody if you're struggling. Secondly, uh, look for God in the small things and start moving. Isaiah, I love Isaiah 57, verse 15. And let, uh, let me read it to you. It says, For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place, and also with him who is of contrite and lowly spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly, and to revive the heart of the contrite. I need that verse all the time. I'm a guy that struggles with melancholy, struggles with, with uh, these kind of things. And uh, I need verses. I, know, I need to know that when I'm in those conditions, God is close to me. I wrap up with this. There was a commercial airliner that was flying, and, and uh, they came on the, the cockpit from the cockpit and said, oh, we're not going to be able to serve refreshments today because we are about to hit some severe turbulence. So everybody kind of gets antsy. If you've ever been on a plane when that happens, you get antsy. And sure enough, they started hitting the turbulence. Man, it was throwing them all over the place. There were people uh, just screaming. There were people just scared to death. There were people, atheists, praying. I mean, they were doing everything they could to, to get this thing to settle out because they thought they were gone. But there was a pastor on the plane. He looked over, and there was a little girl that was sitting over there, and she was, she was just coloring in her coloring book. Not anxious at all. And she was just there through the, through the whole ordeal. And she never wavered, never got worried, never fretted. They eventually landed the plane and the pastor couldn't let the moment pass. So as he was get, getting out of the plane, he came to the little girl and said, Honey, I, you were so good during that turbulence. Um, I just got to ask you, why, how could you stay so calm? And she said, Well, my dad is the pilot. And he said, we're going home. So I knew he would get me home. I think today we need to know that our God is the pilot. Can I take away your discouragement and depression? I wish I could. I wish it was as easy as waving a magic wand. I tell you what, though, we're talking about a crisis in America. And I think it's a crisis for us. And today the Lord is saying, I'm near to the broken heart and I'm near to those that contrite. Come to me. Why don't you bow your heads with me just a moment?